Okay, we're going to begin with a little uh, discussion. You can discuss it in your tables or in pairs. Um, a very simple question, very simple question. Started for 10. How were people saved in the Old Testament? There we are. So how were people saved in the Old Testament? Uh, two minutes, and then we will feed back. I look forward to your answers. Okay, we'll uh, come back together. I think I've overheard some, uh, some good answers. Um, we'll kind of keep circling back to this question as the night goes on. Now, I'm sure the answer that no one gave um, was by good works. Um, sometimes that's the kind of uh, Sunday school answer that's given, perhaps sometimes the misunderstanding, um, that people were saved by good works in the Old Testament. So, so think about it. Think about Noah. So this is what people say. Everybody in the world was evil. All of their thoughts were only evil all the time. And Noah was a righteous man. And so God saved him. Or you look at that heartbeat of death and they died and they died and they died and they died. But Enoch walked with the Lord, which is life with God, and he didn't die. And so sometimes it's possible to look at the Old Testament and deep down to think, were they saved by good works? Well, we're going to try and answer that question uh, tonight, and uh, whilst you've answered it in two minutes, I'll take 15 minutes just to pad it out a little bit. Um, but let me tell you where we've got so far, and it's on the handout, if you can see a handout there. Um, basically, the story so far is that we were created by God um, to rule over the world under God. That's that kind of um, two ways to live uh, kind of image there, if it's on your handout. Um, but actually, we decided to be our own kings. Uh, we rebelled against God. We didn't want God to be Lord under us. And so now we're under a curse, death. And hopefully, last week, when we only did the first 11 chapters of Genesis, um, what you would have seen is, actually, in the midst of that, sin gets worse. That's the thing about sin. So it goes from Adam and Eve to their children and then by the time of Noah to everyone. But even though sin gets worse, actually in those first 11 chapters of Genesis, there are glimmers of the gospel. There are little glimmers that show us that there's something happening. And really there's a cycle in Genesis, and it's a cycle all the way through the Old Testament, where you have sin, judgment, and then grace. Think about what we saw last week. So Adam and Eve sin, God comes and judges them, but yet he clothes them in skin. He takes away their shame. Take a, think of everybody in the days of Noah. They sin, the judgment comes down, but yet God saves Noah and his family, even though actually they were sinners just like everybody else. And so you get this cycle of sin, judgment, and grace. And really, what the opening chapters of the Bible are trying to teach us is that the point of these people is never their goodness, but the grace of God. It's never their goodness, it's always the grace of God. I think you can see that clearly in Abel, Enoch, and Noah. And there's these glimmers. And we saw some of them. Um, the first glimmer we saw really was chapter 3 and verse 15 and 16. We call this the proto evangel uh, Chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, in the midst of the curses, says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. There is the promise of the surf, serpent crusher who's going to come. You see the promise that this serpent crusher is going to do something wider after the flood. So we looked at it briefly right at the end last week, but have a look at Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, after um, the flood and everything comes out, we have the covenant with Noah, um, this amazing agreement and promise. And in Genesis chapter 9, verse 9, it begins like this. I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And actually the first covenant here is what we call a covenant of common grace. So it's a covenant that encapsulates everybody in the world. 
including the animals. He won't flood the earth again. We see common grace coming up in the New Testament, in Acts, in some of the sermons. In Acts 17, it's talked about as divine restraint. In Acts 14, it's talked about as divine favour. But you get to the end of Genesis chapter 11, we've seen this cycle of sin, judgment, and grace, and then we get the Tower of Babel. What happens? They sin. There's judgment. But actually, there's grace. Um, Lots of people would say that the confusing of languages in Babel, even though a punishment of God is a blessing of God. Lots of Welsh speakers would say that. It's a very important Welsh nationalistic text. Um, Because actually it's a blessing on culture. And it's a blessing on variety. And it's a way that they can fulfill the initial commandments to Adam and Eve to go forth into all uh, the world. So... This is how uh, it all starts, the people rebelling in this um, cycle. And if you remember, the reason they built the Tower of Babel and they didn't want to spread was because they wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to be king and they didn't want to be um, scattered. So that's where we ended at Genesis chapter 11. So turn to Genesis chapter 11. They've ignored the original commandment, the kind of creation ordinance. They've now... um, within a covenant of God, have been stopped from building their tower so that they will go out again. And then, chapter 12, uh, we come now to see what happens next. So, um, we're going to cover the patriarchs. Uh, We're going to cover tonight the promised kingdom. And as well, we're going to cover tonight uh, the partial kingdom. So, if you remember last week, we saw that God's kingdom is God's people in God's place under God's blessing. Now, we saw the pattern of that in Eden. God's people were Adam and Eve. God's uh, place was the Garden of Eden, and God's blessing was his word. But what we've had is we've had the, the fallen kingdom. We've had the kingdom destroyed. So what's happened now is God's people, no one. God's place, nowhere. God's blessing, it's just a curse. But what we're going to see now start to come is from Genesis chapter 12, we're going to get the promised kingdom. So who knows where we're going to get to go to see the promised kingdom? The covenant with Abraham. Do you remember the covenant with Abraham? You will be my people. I will give you a land. Who you bless, I will bless. It's as if this system is a biblical one. It's very interesting, isn't it? As I said, I stole it from Vaughan Roberts. He's the guy that came up with this. But it's very helpful. So we're going to see the promise of the kingdom and tonight in the next 41 and a half minutes. We're also going to see the partial kingdom fulfilled. We're going to see a people in a place under God's blessing. But it's not exactly what it's meant to be. So um, let's have a look. Let's see how your um, Old Testament history is. So who's the main character of Genesis 12 to 23? The first patriarch. Abraham, Father Abraham. So it's amazing, God calls Abraham, makes a covenant with him, so it's not this general covenant, this common covenant, but actually this is a special covenant. This is a special promise. You will be uh, my uh, people, and it's amazing all that happens in Abraham. I mean, he gets a promise. He goes to find a land. He goes to wait for a child with his nephew Lot. He goes to Egypt. There's a famine. Then he lies about Sarai being his sister, his half-sister. Who knows? But he lies maybe, perhaps, somehow. It's all very confusing, isn't it? And then this kind of shows something of Abraham's true character. Here is the one who gets the promise, but yet here is the one who has some dodgy dealings, which ultimately comes down to God has promised something, but I don't know if I believe what he's promised again it's echoes of the fall in genesis 3 isn't it god has said something but i'm not quite sure if i believe what he says um the interesting thing about genesis is if you read it quickly it seems like god is speaking to Je- to abraham every day <laughs> but actually when you sit down and read the text and write down his ages you realize this massive gaps of god saying something and decades go by And so here he is, Abraham, now this old man, he's been promised a people and he hasn't got any kids. So he's going, well, how is this happening? And he looks at his wife and goes, this definitely isn't going to happen. And so they take matters into their own hands, don't they? And they get the story of Hagar and Ishmael. It all gets very bitter. Um, There's huge conflict. And that conflict is raining on even today. You just have to turn on the news because of all of that mistake and mess up there. And then 
um, it carries on and you get more promises. You get Isaac. Um, then you get uh, Abraham. Then you get Isaac. Um, another amazing story. So many amazing stories we haven't got time for. Um, who does he fall in love with? Isaac. And it's a lovely name. Anybody know? <laughs> Rebecca. It is a lovely name, isn't it? Then they have twins, Jacob and... So you don't need to come tonight. You know all of the Old Testament, Jacob and Esau. Esau was red and hairy, the firstborn, um, but he sells his birthright to Jacob, and Jacob ultimately steals the birthright, um, but that's kind of his character because then he goes and works with Laban and ends up stealing from him anyway. Um, he was into interesting veterinary practices. The big point of the patriarchs, I want to argue, is they're a mess. <laughs> No one reads Genesis and goes, there's a manual for family life. I mean, they are a mess, but God still uses them. Right off the back from the Old Testament, the whole point is this is not down to their goodness. This is down to grace. And more than that, one of the big points that keeps them coming up in the Old Testament is, and even the blessing of God isn't down to natural descent. Because what have we just seen? Where does God's blessing go? Do you remember? It goes from firstborn to firstborn to... F no, it doesn't at all. The whole point of Esau and Jacob um, is that uh, actually it doesn't go to the firstborn. And God ends up blessing the one who was really sinister. That makes no sense unless you believe in grace. The only reason you'd struggle with that text is because deep down you think God saves us by good works. But if you realize that God doesn't save you by good works, the story of Jacob and Esau makes perfect sense. And so we go on reading it. Uh, who comes next? Or oh, the big story. Jacob marries Rachel, but via Leah. That's always uh, difficult, isn't it? Go Rachel and Leah. You've got the one with glasses, isn't it? The one with weak eyes. I wear glasses, so I can make that point. Um, so who's the next main character? Joseph. And here we get, again, good examples of how not to run uh, your family. Um, but ultimately, what happens, God's people with God's promise going to God's promised land end up in Egypt. And they end up, ultimately, by the time we get out of Genesis into the next book, which is called Exodus, as slaves in Egypt. And so you've got these characters, these patriarchs who are really weak. And the whole point is they all fall, and they repeatedly fall. The big lesson of Genesis and the patriarchs is God's promise is based on his goodness and grace, not on your goodness. He's building a people, but he's building it with people you just wouldn't think about. And it all comes down to these covenants, this promise he makes with Abraham. So let's have a look at the covenant. Um, let's split up in pairs. Um, Hopefully you could fill, follow along there and fill in uh, the blanks of the patriarchs in Genesis. Have a look at these passages. Genesis 12, 1 to 9. Genesis 15, verse 17. And then Genesis 17, 1 to 14. Have a, have a quick scan through. You've got a good three or four minutes. And then in your pairs or your groups, what were the promises and conditions of the covenants? Okay, let's have a bit of time on that. <laughs> 
Okay, we'll uh, we'll come back. I know there's a lot to cover, but um, we'll see what we can go. So, so um, what were the covenant? What were the marks of the covenant? Some of the standout things. Let's just shout them out. Great nation. So he's going to make great people. Yeah. They're going to be blessed. Yeah, there's going to be blessings from God. Pardon? They're going to have the promised land, so they're going to have somewhere to live. They're going to have a great name. I mean, these are amazing promises. So this really is um, the promise of the kingdom. And the promise is given to a gallery of rogues. You've got to see that. Um, They are a gallery of rogues. None of them are the perfect thing. Okay? Um, God loves who God loves. God chooses who he chooses. Um, Yes. Yeah, and who owns it? Well, God or Abraham, yeah. But we're going to look. We're going to come to that. We'll come to the book of Judges now, and we'll we'll see. So you've got all of these promises um, coming out. Um, and uh, here's the question: Will Abraham and his descendants keep the promises? <laughs> no, um, not at all. Okay, let's see um, what happens now. Interestingly, Abraham, before we leave him, even though he was a mess. What did Jesus say about Abraham? Does anybody remember Jesus ever speaking about Abraham? Sorry? A righteous man? Say again. It's interesting, isn't it? We're we're not picking up on the key thing about Abraham. Saved by faith? Yes. Yes. It's interesting, isn't it? But John 8, verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Or Romans 4. Have you ever heard any sermons going through the book of Romans? Romans chapter 4. It was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promises that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes through faith. All of these people in Genesis, if they were saved, were saved through faith in Jesus. And that gets really confusing, doesn't it? But it can't be. We all want to default back to the good works, you see, because once you take away faith in Christ, it's got to be some kind of good works, some kind of actions. So how does it all happen? Now, the illustration I always use, which you've probably heard me use before, so I apologize, is like going out for a meal with someone very rich. What I mean is this. If you get invited out for a nice meal with someone who, you know, just eats at better places than you and can afford better places, it's always lovely, isn't it? Because you go, I'm going to order. And it's not that I'm going to order and not look at the price. I'm actually going to order, look at the price and order the most expensive thing. This is going to be wonderful. But can you imagine if on the way for the meal, you get a text from your friend, really sorry, running late, but I will be there. Just go ahead and order. Now, you go to the restaurant, you know you can't afford to pay for the meal. Here's the question. Do you trust that your friend A has the ability to pay the bill and B is a person of their word and they'll turn up to pay the bill? If you believe they have the money and they have the character, you will order your food. That's how they were saved in the Old Testament. They were promised that Jesus would come. The serpent crusher was going to come. And what happens is, throughout the Old Testament, we get what we sometimes call progressive revelation. Some people misunderstand that and think they knew nothing in Genesis and God progressively revealed from nothing to something. That's not right. They knew an awful lot in Genesis. They may not have known the details. They might not have been able to come to Cornerstone and preach. But they knew that God was a God who saved them despite themselves. They knew grace already. They'd seen it day in, day out. And they believed in the promises, even if they didn't quite understand what that looked like. And so really what they had was was faith in what God would do through Jesus. And there's an entire chapter in the book of Hebrews all about that, called Hebrews chapter 11. (laughs) where it goes through, and you find out things like, does anybody know why Moses gave up the courts of Pharaoh, according to the Bible? 
Does anybody know Gen uh, Hebrews 11? Moses gave up the court of Pharaoh for the sake of Christ. It's fascinating, isn't it? So what exactly he understood? Who knows? That's beyond my pay grade. But they did trust in, in grace. So um, let's keep going forward. So now we're going to get the partial kingdom. We get the promise in chapter 12. Let's get to keep going. And now we start to get through the patriarchs. We've seen what they're still like. We see the promises coming. Then we get our second book, uh, the book of Exodus. And the book of Exodus is brilliant uh, because the book of Exodus um, can be split up into three parts. Um, firstly, you get the God who delivers. That's the first thing you get in the book of Exodus, the God who delivers. Um, we're going to skip looking at the name of God there. We haven't got time this evening. Um, but what we have here is the people have gone to Egypt. They've ended up in slavery. They've forgotten God. And it seems like God has forgotten them. But when they cry out, God hears them. And so God sends Moses and Aaron to help him. It's to help them. It's amazing. You get an amazing battle with Pharaoh. This is the first time, really, that the gospel and the covenant promises are put to the test. Who will win? If it's who you will bless, I will bless, and who curses you, I will curse. Here's the question. When you go up against the ultimate superpower of the day, who's going to win? And interestingly, when you go through um, all of what happens with Pharaoh and all of um, the plagues, an argument can be made, and I think it's fair, but you can discuss it over Coco tonight, um, that all of the plagues are against deities of, of Egypt, that one by one he's knocking down the things that they, they trust in. But ultimately, how are they saved in the end from Egypt? What is the last plague? The death of the firstborn. And how do they avoid that? By the sacrificial uh, lamb, by the offering, by the blood going on the doorposts, and then death passes over. So you get this God who delivers. He takes them out, takes them out into the wilderness, gives them provisions, power, uh, pil pillars of smoke and fire, manna and quail from heaven, water from a rock. He even gives them elim, which just sounds amazing, doesn't it? With all of this water. Um, but then we get a God who demands. That's the second thing that happens in Exodus. He saves them. Then he gives them the Ten Commandments and the laws. And that order is vital. So God saves them, and then he gives them the laws. So the trick question I always ask, so you're never going to fall for this again, how does the Ten Commandments start? How does the Ten Commandments start? Say again. Exactly. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. It does not start with, you must not have any other gods. It starts with grace. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. I have saved you. I have heard your cries. And so the God who demands comes off the, the God who delivers. And then, having given them the Ten Commandments and all of the laws, what's the next thing that God does for them in Exodus? What does he tell them to do? You can turn over the sheet and see a picture and cheat if you want. Guess them to build a tabernacle. Here's my question. Why? What's the tabernacle there to deal with? Their sin. This is brilliant, isn't it? I've saved you, so here's my law. You're going to mess it up. So here's how you deal with it. It's oozing grace all over the place. And here's what's even better. The tabernacle doesn't just deal with sin, but gives you the presence of God. Now, this is amazing. So where should the tabernacle go? Should it go miles away from the people, up on a high mountain? Should it go in a place where it's all kind of, no, where, where are they going to put it? Does anybody know? Where does the tabernacle go in the camp? Hmm? In the center. God is going to be with his people by grace. So we have the God who delivers, then we have the God who demands, but then thirdly, you have the God who draws near. Now, this is the partial kingdom. And so even though God draws near and he's in the center, there's still a wall. There's still an outer court. There's still the inner sanctuary. There's still a curtain to stop you going into the Holy of Holies. 
still needs sacrifices, but he's drawing near. He's coming closer. Um, Now, uh, I don't need to ask this question because you were in church this morning, but if you were in church this morning, uh, when he gave the law, what was the role of the law? You you shared the answer this morning. To make us aware of sin. It's very, very simple, isn't it? I love that uh, way that uh, Simon Ponsonby puts it, two SOSs, show our sin, show our saviour. That's what it does. I would add a third SOS, which is show our sanctification. I think that's what the Lord does. The Puritans would say that the law pushes you to Christ for salvation and then Christ pushes you back to the law for sanctification. Um, So the law still has a place now. So this morning we spoke about it. Um, Paul in Romans chapter 7, I ran out of time this morning, um, so I didn't quite get the time to explain this. But it's interesting, Paul seems to have a love-hate relationship with the law, doesn't he? At times you think he's saying, it's terrible. It's terrible. And then he goes, so is it sinful? Well, of course not, because it's holy, righteous, and good. You're like, Paul, make your mind up. It's because the law is, it's, yes, it's good, but it's not brilliant. I say uh, sometimes um, to people that really the law is like a pair of stabilizers on a bike. I mean, stabilizers are good. They help you keep up your bike when you can't cycle your bike. But once you can ride your bike, <laughs> you don't want the stabilizers anymore. So are stabilizers good? Yeah. Are they brilliant? No. The law, in some sense, is a schoolmaster. It's like a stabilizer. It's building around, giving you physical, external understandings of what God is doing so you can see it. Because if God just jumps straight to Matthew from Genesis, people will be like, what? <laughs> God's come down? And it's interesting because when you read the Gospel of Matthew, and when I preach through the Gospel of Matthew, have you noticed what the Gospel of Matthew does? It runs through Genesis, Exodus, and the first five books of the Old Testament. Because all of the Old Testament is preparing you for the New Testament. It's this um, kind of gradual, increasing revelation. So that when Jesus comes, you'll go, oh, this is like... The Exodus, this is like the Passover. This is, they would have seen the physical, external things of it to learn um, to be ready for him. So we've got Exodus. So they go out, they're in the uh, promised land. They're going to go to the promised land. So it's brilliant. So now they're God's people. And they're under God's blessing now in that they've got God's law, which is a blessing. It's good to know what God likes. But they're not in God's uh, land. So... How long was it meant to take them to get to God's land, roughly? Does anybody know? Hmm? 40 days or so? I mean, they were going to go and, you know, if they'd walked straight there, I mean, you know, if they parted the Red Sea, they could get there. But it ended up taking 40 years. Um, Why was that? Because they sinned. But yet he still provided for them every single day. So even in the punishment, there was grace. And he keeps them uh, going. And so we have Exodus. um, Then we have the book of Leviticus, which again is really how the tabernacle works at the height of it. Um, You've got um, the Day of Atonement. Um, We haven't got time to get into it. We're going to keep going. Then we have, uh, um, after um, Leviticus, let's keep going, we have the book of Numbers which always amazes me because there's not that many numbers in the book of Numbers. Um, And uh, you read past the initial uh, numbers, um, but that is brilliant um, because what's going to happen here is we're getting to the promised land. Um, We've also got the book of Deuteronomy, which is Moses kind of overlooking the promised land and giving a speech and telling them all about what's going um, to happen. But now they're getting to the point where God's people under God's blessing are now going to have God's land. They're going to be in God's place. But remember, they're fallen people. So when they get to the edge and they go, better find out what it's like, what do they do? Do you remember? They send in the spies. And what do the spies say, generally speaking? Ah! <laughs> There's no way. And you're like... Don't you remember what happened in Egypt with Pharaoh and the plagues? Can't you remember how God has just looked after you for 40 years? But they panic and they rebel. Uh, Can I just point out, every pastor likes to point this out. 
the greatest sin in the wilderness? Grumbling. Just putting it out there <laughs> to remind you the greatest sin in any church is grumbling. Um, but they go, uh, they, they struggle, but ultimately, who's going to speak for the Lord? Who's going to stand up and say, no, we can do this out of the spies? Joshua. Come on. We can go in. If God is for us, um, let's go. And so uh, they come on the edge. Now, Deuteronomy, I want us to notice this um, because I want to pause here a bit. Have a look at Deuteronomy chapter 7 and uh, have a look at verse 1 to 7. And what are they commanded to do in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 to 7? Got just two minutes. Just have a quick glance through it. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Okay, let's come together. So what, it's quite a heavy passage, isn't it? So what are they commanded to do in 7, 1 to 7? Yep. Yep, to destroy um, everything, to go in, uh, to take over. Where else are they commanded? Hmm? Make no treaty. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, get out of your comfort zone. Interestingly, it's interesting because a lot of the laws have been about how you deal with aliens, with sojourners from people to other nations, which is very interesting. Now, um, we haven't got time to go into this tonight, but there is only a limited span of time in the Old Testament and only in a very limited occasion here where this is actually commanded. Often people like to tell you that God all the way through the Old Testament is doing this. Um, it only happens when they go into the land, into the promised land. Um, that is the one time where this, um, this command, cherem, is that? Look at that. I, I always say to the other preachers, never use Greek or Hebrew, particularly when Dan is here, but I'll chuck that one out there, which is to completely destroy, to utterly annihilate. Um, and we get really quite shocked by that, and understandably so. But don't start to think that God was commanding that right, left, and center. Um, it's at one occasion and the one people that they refuse to do this to at that time pop up in another book. Can you remember what other book they pop up in? The people they didn't completely annihilate? Esther. Because what happens when you don't trust God that he knows best? You end up with a holocaust. Sometimes we like to think that everybody outside of Israel in the Old Testament were lovely moral people. They didn't kill their babies and smash them on the rocks and then hide them in the walls and bury them there. They were lovely people. How dare God come and just destroy their lovely world? We forget the Noah covenant, that actually all of the world was only evil all the time, and it's only a covenant of grace to all people remembered in the rainbow that we're all alive. Everybody's alive only by God's common grace. And so what we see here is God's judgment, which is right and proper and is going to come, 
being brought forward, even though actually it's been held off. So he's completely within his realms um, to do it. But it is a very difficult question, and um, we can look at it more deeply at another um, point. But he goes. But it's also also important to remember that the commands that they give as they're going into the promised land aren't just these external commands. Go forward to chapter 10, Deuteronomy chapter 10, and verses 12 to 13. As they're going in, Deuteronomy chapter 12, uh, chapter 10, sorry, verses 12 to 13 says this. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commandments and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good? It's a heart religion. We often think of it always as being external. But actually, he wants them to love him with their heart. So they go into the promised land. Moses dies and Joshua, uh, the hero of the spies, uh, takes over. Uh, they go in and there are miracle victories, um, particularly with Jericho and the sun standing still. Um, but by the end of the book, um, basically, they've pretty much taken possession of Canaan. They're now God's people in God's land under God's rule and blessing. But it isn't perfect, is it? Should we get to the end of uh, Joshua? Let's get to Joshua's um, farewell. Let's go to the book of Joshua. And if you go to the end of Joshua, Joshua 23, um, here's Joshua's farewell, having gone into the promised land. Um, Joshua chapter 23, beginning at verse 12. But if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your backs and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Ultimately, they went into the promised land. They pretty much gave up halfway through. They took the victory that was theirs and didn't bother taking the rest of it. Why? They probably knew better than God. What could go wrong? It's a, an agreement we make with sin every season of our life, isn't it? God says to get rid of sin, take off the old self, and every season of our life we go, well, did God really say, do I really have to be ruthless with that sin in my life? It's only a small thing, isn't it? I leave that, my little precious. Slowly but surely, that little precious, those, as Don Carson calls it, thousand insignificant decisions, all snowball to take us away from Christ. And so there's lots of lessons in the Old Testament. One Corinthians would say that one of the reasons we have the Old Testament is so that we have lessons for our Christian lives, so that we know how to follow um, Jesus. So they come in. Then we get the book of what comes after Joshua? Judges. Woohoo, the judges. And so they come in, and um, because they haven't got rid of everybody as they were meant to get rid of people, and because they've started to make treaties and different things like that, all the time the book of Judges is basically a book on repeat. That's what the book of Judges is. And so what happens, and some of you, I think, have got it on your sheet here, um, the book of Judges and you, um, Ruth, you end up with what we had earlier on, which was sin, judgment, and grace. Now we have it in a sevenfold kind of cycle that just gets repeated through the book of um, Judges. So you can read Judges, and you can see this cycle time and time again. So what happens? Um, Israel serves the Lord. That's how they start. Lord, you are brilliant. And then Israel falls into sin and idolatry. They're serving the Lord, and then they see another God. Oh, that's an interesting God, because it hasn't rained for months. But they've got a rain God. We'll have a little bit of that. And before you know it, they fall into sin and idolatry. Then what happens? Israel is enslaved. That's what I've been trying to teach you over the last two weeks. What sin does is offer you everything and then take everything. So Israel ends up enslaved. Then Israel cries out to the Lord. What did we learn in Exodus? If you cry out to the Lord, the Lord will hear you and the Lord will come and save you. And guess what? He doesn't just do it the first time. 
He does it the second time and the 22nd time because it's all of grace. And so the way he does it in the book of Judges is by raising up a judge. He raises up, um, not a Martin Brown, okay? So not a judge. Although Martin Brown, I'm sure, could save a nation. But what I mean is it's not a court judge, but this really is a warrior leader. Um, someone who's going to lead uh, the warriors, um, very different from other leaders, although there is a judge who is a warrior leader and a prophet. Does anybody know which judge that is? Probably the greatest of all the judges, I'll say controversially. Yeah? Me. You? Levi? Yeah. Very good. A very good judge. <laughs> judge and prophet. Does anybody know? Do you know Dan? Deborah. Have a look. Could possibly be the greatest of all the judges. It's definitely the only one there that is um, a leader and a prophet, which is fascinating. And so comes, raises up a judge, then Israel is delivered, and then it all happens again. And this cycle is repeated and repeated and repeated. So what you've got here is the partial kingdom. Okay? They are God's people, and they are in God's land, and they are under God's blessing, but they just can't get out of this cycle of sin. And so right in the midst of the book of Judges, you get a beautiful little book. You get Ruth, which is probably um, one of my favorite books. The interesting thing about Ruth is, what's the glimmer of the gospel that Ruth gives us? Where is Ruth from? Moab. Ruth is lovely, right in the midst of judges. Ruth is there to remind us that God is an international God. Because the covenant, back with Abraham, talks about all nations. A great nation going to um, all nations. And so uh, you get this time. The point is, I think, in the book of Judges, and we're going to get a little bit... We'll have to work this out now together, okay? Surely one of the points of the book of Judges is, Israel needs a leader. <laughs> because they keep messing up. And so what's God's answer each time they mess up? He gives them a leader. He gives them a judge. But the lesson at the end of judges, well, here's a question for you. Does the cycle of sin and the repeated nature of judges leave Israel in a better or a worse place at the end of judges? It's a worse place. The end of judges is probably the most disturbing part of the Bible. I, I, because we've got younger people tonight, I'm not even going to mention it. It's probably the one of the most disturbing parts of the Bible. Because actually, raise up human leaders. This is what you're going to end up doing. So, how does the book end? Everybody did everything that was right in their own eyes. And why? According to the end of Judges. Does anybody know Judges 21? Verse 25. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. So, obviously, the problem is they're judges, not kings. So what we need is a king. And if we get a king, everything will be A-OK. -okay. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. Or... Is there something deeper going on in the text here? Is there a better king? So we go on and we get to 1 Samuel. And uh, in 1 Samuel, we start to get now to um, when Israel has a land and now they're going to have a king. They're going to have a monarchy. Um, that's what's going to happen. So here's a question for you. Were Israel meant to have a king? Did God want them to have a king? Are you sure? Hmm? Will that stand up to the scrutiny of scripture? Let's have a little look. So come with me. Um, have a look at Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. 
So go back to Deuteronomy when they're preparing to go into the promised land. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 uh, to 20. Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 to 20. The king. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like the nations around us. It's a very interesting uh, request, isn't it? Be sure to appoint over you a king that the Lord your God chooses. Well, if there wasn't meant to be a king, it's a strange thing to give commandments for choosing a king. Maybe we should move on to 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verses 6 to 9. 1 Samuel 8, 6 to 9. But when they say, or when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you. It's not you they've rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the kings who will reign over them will claim as his rights. See, God is out of time, isn't he? And he's Lord of all. He knew what they were going to do. So even before they went in there, he was like, well, this is what they're going to want. And this is how you're going to respond. And this is how you're going to do it. Why? Because they still don't get it. They still don't get that God is their king. They're still looking to the other nations. This is the perennial problem of all believers. We look to everybody else and look at what they've got and look at what they do. So if they're doing it, well, surely I should do it too. That must be the best thing because look at their life. And Israel were doing it all the time. And so instead of looking to God who has rescued them and been faithful to them all the way through the Old Testament, they look to the other nations and they appoint a king. So they appoint a king and uh, what do they decide they're looking for in a king? Height. <laughs> I mean, it's just farcical, isn't it? Um, they choose a king um, on height, but then they got it wrong, so they get it right. So then they choose, secondly, a king who... What is David? What's he marked for having? He's a man after God's own heart, which is wonderful. But the problem is, even a king who is a man after God's own heart doesn't go to war when he should, looks at things off the top of his building that he shouldn't, has affairs, and, you know, just like everybody else, sets about using warfare and all of his military to kill someone to get out of the way. I mean, what are we seeing here? This is the sin in man and the cycle of sin. So you get David, then you get 2 Samuel. The book of 2 Samuel comes um, and uh, get Jerusalem as the capital. Um, 2 Samuel chapter 7 gives us a lovely moment. 2 Samuel chapter 7, lovely uh, moment. 2 Samuel chapter 7, after the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. Now the partial kingdom is starting to look impressive. But there's an issue. The issue is this kingdom is going to endure forever, but the kings don't endure forever. Now we haven't got time to go into that. Then we get into one kings. One kings. Uh, who's the king in one kings? The big main king? Solomon. Solomon's the main king. And really what we get to is the golden age of um, the monarchy, really. The golden age of Israel, who is the best dignitary who comes to visit Israel because their monarchy is so amazing. Does anybody remember? The Queen of Sheba. I mean, this is amazing. They're doing brilliantly. This is the best the kingdom has been since Eden. This is the height in terms of the kingdom of God in the Old Testament. God's people in God's place under God's blessing, and it looks good. And Solomon comes. He's a great leader. What books of the Old Testament does Solomon write? I think I've got them all down there for you. You can cheat. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Song of Solomon, 
I mean, it's brilliant. Look at um, Solomon, and I would say there's four W's that sum him up. Wisdom, wealth, writings, and worship. We're running out of time, so I'm going to have to keep you going. And there was a fifth W that got him into trouble. Wives. What was the big thing? Don't intermarry. And what does he start doing? Intermarrying right, left, and centre. And so the whole kingdom, basically, after him, comes crashing down. After Solomon, you get the division of the kingdom. Um, so Rehoboam, his son, becomes king. And really, you get Rehoboam and Jeroboam. You get the two kingdoms. You get the ten northern tribes who rebel under Jeroboam. Um, and after 120 years, the kingdom is now uh, divided. Um, I'm running out of... How are we doing? I'm running out of time. So let me um, keep, keep going. So the kingdoms, they divide. Two kings, the decrease um, continues. And basically, what you end up in now is a cycle of increasing debauchery. That's what happens now. The kingdom goes into free fall. And ultimately, um, in two kings... Uh, the northern tribe is carried on off into exile by Assyria, if you remember. And then the southern kingdom is overtaken by Babylon. It actually goes alphabetically in English, which is nice and easy. So the Assyrians come, then the Babylonians come. And who's the next person you've got to think about? It begins with a K, Cyrus. It's a, a kind of, anyway, don't worry about that. That's just how I remember my history. Um, but everything comes crashing down, two kings. And that's where really the prophets all start to fit in. Next week, we're going to look at the prophets, okay? Next week, we're going to look at what the prophets were saying, what the prophets were doing um, in all of this time. And so what happens is, if you uh, want to look at where we are, um, we get to the partial kingdom. But unfortunately, the partial kingdom comes crashing down. God's people are divided, they're taken out to the promised land, and there's no blessing, there's only curse. And so what we're going to see next week is how during this partial kingdom's collapsed, you then get the prophesied kingdom. So we're going to look next week at what God was saying to them when all of this was coming, crashing down. Now, we've got to end with, where was Jesus in all of this? What was going on? So, in 59 seconds... Where was he? Well, we didn't have time to look at the name that God gave himself in Exodus, but what name did God give himself in the burning bush? I am. Jesus came and said, I am. What about the lamb that was sacrificed, the Passover lamb? John the Baptist looked at Jesus and said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We have been saved not from one nation. That's why they got really confused in the New Testament. Because they thought Jesus was just going to come and rescue them from the Romans, just as he rescued them from the um, Egyptians. But actually, Jesus has come to, to, to save us from Satan, sin, and death, eternal slavery. What about being rescued through water? That's a theme that comes through the New Testament. Or what about Jesus, the one who fulfills the law and lives the law at every point? Well, what about the tabernacle? And John 1, how he talks about how the Lord Jesus came and tabernacled amongst us. What about the bread of presence in the tabernacle? When Jesus comes and says he is the bread of life. Or the lampstand in the tabernacle. I'm starting to sound like a brethren here again, very excited with the tabernacle. But he is the light that brings, uh, um, the lamp that brings light to us. What about the day of atonement in the middle of Leviticus? Well, Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. What about that glorious little book, Ruth? I love the way Spurgeon puts it, my glorious Boaz. That's who Jesus is, my glorious Boaz. Friends, we're all Ruth. We're aliens who are destitute, who have been brought in by Jesus. Jesus is our ultimate David, our ultimate Messiah, our Christ. He's the greatest Solomon. He's our true wisdom he is the temple. And so Jesus, I think, is everywhere there. So we're going to finish by singing together.